Hello, and welcome back to another episode of Get Your Fill, Financial Independence and Long Life, where we explore ways to achieve those two goals and cool people come on to help us. And that's what's happening today. We have Jay Zygmunt. He is an awesome guy, very cool, very understanding with me as I am completely strung out from podcast interviews today. He's the founder of Child Free Wealth, and I'm child free. And, you know, people used to describe us as childless, but it's not like, I'm not like a barren wasteland. I just didn't happen to want children. <laughs> so it's, I'm child free and it's like liberating. So don't be embarrassed and don't be like, you know, hiding your head in the sand when people say, don't you have any kids? So <clears throat> Jay, Dr. Jay is the founder of Child Free Wealth, a life and financial planning firm dedicated to helping child free people. He's the author of the book, Portraits of Child-Free Wealth, and the co-host of the Child-Free Wealth podcast. Dr. J, thanks for being with us today. Hey, thanks for having me. I mean, like, I love it when people actually can know the difference between child-free, child-less, the terms, like, you can even dig in without it. <laughs> so this is a very interesting niche, and tell me how you got started with this. Yeah, so I'm one of those weird people. I come to finance from another career. You know, I came out of healthcare and academia and went to become a certified financial planner. And the weird part is there's nothing in this CFP literature at all about being child free. Everything assumes you have kids. You either will or you they're gone. Or and I I kind of it, it was one of those like I, I'm I'm PhD, I'm a researcher by nature. I'm like, are we just weird? You know, like me and my wife are child free, like are we the weirdos or what? And Come to find out about 25% of the U.S. are child-free or permanently childless. And it changes just about everything about the financial plan. But yet all the financial advice is about people having kids. And, and just for clarification, the terminology child-free, childless, everybody has their own pick on it. But really, I mean, people who don't have kids and aren't planning on having kids. Like if you if the kids are gone for the weekend, you're not child-free. You know, they're just <laughs> not there for the weekend. But it does change everything. And my thing is, well, why are why is it overlooked? Well, you know, it's interesting <laughs> when you said that I was reminded that that was, that's one of the reasons that people gave me of why I should have children, because who's going to take care of me in my old age? <laughs> like, so, okay. I, children I, I age love you. Anything with this question. We're going to, we're going to start in the deep end already. You know, <laughs> like this question of who's going to take care when you're older is two things. I don't like the assumption that's in there because what they're really saying is they're assuming their kids are going to take care of them. Right. Which, by Surprise. the way, yeah, not always going to happen. Uh, <laughs> let me give you the numbers. On so the U.S. Census looked at adults over fifty-five, and they they use the term childless, and they looked at childless folks, and two point five percent got any financial support from family. So I mean, it's nothing. Right. But in the same population, adults over fifty-five in the U.S., one point five percent of parents got any financial support. So the bottom line is, yep, we got to have a plan for it, but so does everybody else. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> you know, it, it, yeah, I came out of healthcare. And if you, if you assume having kids are going to mean they're going to come visit you in the home. Yeah. Forget it. Forget it. Yeah. I mean, yeah. If that's the, that's your best case. Yeah. Best case scenario is that they'll come visit you. But if you're looking for financial support or someone who's going to bring you into their home to care for you. I mean, that's not what I'm seeing, you know? Well, I mean, we're it, it's one of those things. Unfortunately, in the U.S., we do a terrible job of taking care of our elderly folks. I mean, it's just, that's the honest truth. And they talk about the sandwich generation. People taking care of their kids and their parents at the same time. The child-free folks work the open face sandwich. We're taking care of our parents <laughs> while we don't have kids. And there's actually a weird thing that happens. We have a eight-step program. A no, we call them the no-baby steps for child-free folks. And step seven <laughs> is plan for mom and dad. Because it's so common. The child free folks are like, oh, you don't have kids, so you can take care of mom. Yes. It's you know, true. I can take care it's of my true. mom since I was 16, you know, in different ways. Yeah. It doesn't mean she's moving in from me, because I'll tell you right now, nobody's moving in with us. Like, you know, my wife <laughs> and I just it's a boundary. We're not doing it. <laughs> but you know, it's funny. This is just a little a mini detour because Thanksgiving is next week as we're recording this. And we were just having this conversation in the office yesterday because it's like people who don't have kids are the ones that have to schlep all over the town to go to everybody else's house because when well, we have kids, so you have to come to our house for Thanksgiving, our house for Christmas. I was like, dude, I don't want to. 
I want to have it at my house or I want to go out to a restaurant or whatever, you know. You're uh, absolutely right. A little rant. The, <laughs> yeah, the Society for Human Resource Management did a study on people who don't have kids. And they found that they're expected to cover vacations. They're expected to work longer hours. Like, I mean, there's a whole bunch of like, you know, these things that just happen. Well, oh, you don't need Christmas off because you don't have a family. Oh, no, I have a family. It just has no kids. Right. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. So that's like, this is an under an underappreciated discrimination that's going on rampantly in the world, right? <laughs> yeah, there's actually a group called the New Legacy Institute that's working on how do we get equal benefits for people that are non-parents? You know, like healthcare benefits and other things. I mean, it's just all the different biases, but people don't see it. And then you point it out and they're like, they see it everywhere. You know, so you have to get used to it. It's actually called uh, a pronatalist bias. It's a bias to have kids. And then those of us who don't, well, we're just kind of left on the side. It's so true. It's so true. So how does it tell us some of the ways in which it differs, in which your your financial plan should differ? So I'm going to spin the script on here, Christine, and ask you some questions because you're child-free. You know, might as well see if you fit all the, the, yeah. the check boxes. <laughs> so- most child-free folks don't care how much they pass on to the next generation. Is that true? It's true. I mean, I'm I'm sort of saying, so I have an, I have one nephew who's 16 now. And that, so he's like the beneficiary of everything. But I'm just like, you know, does he deserve it? You know, does, it, does he care about it? Does he want it? You know, he's not here like every day the way a child would be learning about the business and stuff like that. So do I even, does it even make sense to leave the business to him? Do you know what I mean? Like all this kind of stuff. It's, it's, I'm, he's just like the default character. I should just leave it all to charity probably, you know? Well, I mean, for us, our nephews get what's left over, but if they get like 10 grand or hundred grand, I'm fine with that. If they get a million dollars, I made a mistake. Right. I should have given to charity or given to them earlier or something. You should have spent it faster is what right. you should have done. <laughs> I mean, so child-free folks are trying to die with zero. You know, there's actually a book on that, Bill Perkins. It's great read. And so if you're trying to die with zero, that changes all the numbers before it. You know, so yeah. let, let's keep working this through. So I'm going to keep picking on Christine and she didn't know I was going to do this. So, you know, hey, you know, you go on a podcast, you might as well. Interview hey, the interviewer. I'm up for anything. Let's do it. <laughs> so my guess is, like many child-free folks, a standard retirement is not what you're looking for. You'll probably cut back on work versus just cut out completely. Yeah. Well, I'm 60 already. So this is basically my retirement. You know, I mean, I work however many hours a day I feel like working, but it's not, uh, I don't ever see myself just sitting around doing nothing, I guess, you know, I'm not going to like suddenly start decide I want to play golf every day or whatever. So yeah, you're right. Yeah. We call it file financial independence, live early versus financial independence, retire early. Yeah. You know, retire early is kind of like an on off switch for work. File is more of a dimmer switch. And you're in the dimmer switch. You kind of turned I'm, it down. Dim. <laughs> you're doing your thing. Okay. Yeah. So now watch this. So now we've said that you're going to die with zero and you don't want to retire. Well, just about everything else has now changed about your financial plan. Yeah, so absolutely. If you get kind of techy on the finance stuff, they talk about Monte Carlo simulations and you know, you're running a thousand simulations, but the whole goal of that is to not run out of money. Yeah. Well, the reality check is for a child free for person, if it says 99% success, that's a 99% failure because <laughs> you're passing on money to generation you don't care about. Exactly. <laughs> like it totally flips all of financial planning. You know, we'll talk about financial independence. You know, they, people are just stuck on this 4% safe withdrawal rate. And right now, Dave Ramsey's made his news with it and, you know, with, you know the numbers, the percentages. But here's the thing. That all assumes you want to keep the principal. Exactly. What the heck do I want to keep the principal for? <laughs> so it completely changes that math. It does. And, and what happens is once you start seeing it, the software, the financial planning software, the, the order of operations, everything you've seen online, all have it built into it assumptions that don't match a child-free life. Yeah, you're to absolutely the, right. Wow. Yeah, to the point where we look at it, and this is, this is why I loved your podcast, is we look at it and say, first question is, what life do you want to live? Then what are your finances? Then what are your taxes? Yeah. Not, you know, what are your finances? And then what can you live? You know, people call me, well, when can I retire? And I go, well, do you want to retire? No. Well, then why are we talking about retirement? <laughs> you know, and that's a shift that's just not common. Yeah. Yeah. 
That's so true. It does. It flips everything on its head. It does. Because I, I mean, I mean so- if I want to do this 4% thing, I have to have like five or six million dollars. Like, when the hell am I going to save that? <laughs> well, and then you're going to give five or six million to your nephew. Exactly. What the, he's never going to work. He's going to become a bum. Well, good. That's not good. Kids need to work for shit. <laughs> I mean, our nephews, I mean, they have 529s. We have some college funds set aside for them. That's when they need the money now. Yeah. They don't need it at the end. Exactly. By the time I die, I mean, he's going to be, God knows how old. My aunt lived to be 105. So he, he'll be like in his 60s himself. <laughs> Absolutely. And that's the problem is all these assumptions and then you have to rebuild it. Now, at the same time, there's some things that the system is broken. Like, for example, if you don't have a next of kin, the healthcare and government systems break down. You need to have your wills, power of attorneys, all that in place. And you need to know somebody that you trust enough to make those decisions for you. Yeah. Because that, and and that's hard because the default is your next of kin. And for the 32.1% of child-free folks that never marry, if you don't have a spouse and no next of kin, it gets hard quick. You're right. My, My, right now, my, my will is assuming that I die fairly soon so it's my mother who takes care of everything well i mean she's 83 <laughs> it's going the wrong direction <laughs> that's not a long-term plan <laughs> right you need to be on you need to be her executor not the other way around i am but you know <laughs> no but i mean this is what happens yeah it, it, same with the power of attorney okay my my mom well no your mom is the wrong direction <laughs> you know it, True. It, and then it becomes all right what's next and and the Unfortunately, in the U.S., at least, if you don't have a Mexican, the government will appoint somebody for you, and I don't trust them. Like, just, Give me and, a break. No, exactly. And if you don't have a will, they will, in theory, search for your next of kin, but they like put an ad in the newspaper saying, hey, anyone know Christine? No? Okay. It's our money. Like, I mean, No problem. We'll keep it. They don't really search that hard. <laughs> Would you? No, but I mean, you know it's it's just all these things you don't even think about yeah you're right it's a whole different scenario i mean let's even go with basics everybody in finance says oh you need 10 to 12 times your income in life insurance not if you're child free because <laughs> unless you got like suck it. <laughs> debt or you got like a business that you got to buy out there's no reason to have life insurance <laughs> but on the other hand disability insurance is much more important yes you know I mean, the hard part is once you add it all up, you realize, you know, I, I started to write an article once, what, you know, the top 15 things that change in your financial plan. And I ran out of, you know, I kept on going after 15 and I'm like, <laughs> it just changes everything. Yeah, absolutely. So do you have more questions for me? What your, your typical child-free questionnaire? <laughs> so the other one is, do you have a plan for your mom? Uh, for caring for her, for your support? Nope. Need one. I mean, she might have one, but I don't think so. She's in senior housing, but th- there's no like plan, you know? So interestingly enough for the child-free folks, their parents not planning could hurt their financial plan more than their own planning options. Interesting. Yeah. You know, so you say, hey, mom's in a home. Cool. Well, how, who's paying for it and for how long and who's making decisions for it? All? It, it becomes a huge thing. And like you say, because we're the ones who are most likely going to take on the brunt of that because, well, you don't have any kids. Why don't you do it? Like, because I got nothing else to do. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it's funny, you know, you and I, this is our first time meeting, but I can assume a lot of things about your life that would fit because you're child free. Yeah. But what the problem is, if you go to a standard financial planner, they go, oh, you'll change your mind or, you know, we'll just do the same plan. Well, it just doesn't fit. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and, and they don't really get to you. They're not going to be interested. They're not even going to think about all the different ways that your whole paradigm is completely different than, than somebody who has kids and wants to leave a legacy. Absolutely. And, and, you know, most of my, actually all my clients are either uh, couples or single women. I don't have any men right now. I don't know why. Just my, my, my Instagram followership is like 89% women. (laughs) And what happens is they go, well, women invest differently or women like, well, that's a big, broad brush. Yeah. Well, child free makes a big difference. And I had a discussion. I was in a conference and they were talking about how women invest. And they go, well, 
if you get divorced and you don't have kids, it's not as bad. I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. That's a lot of assumptions there, you know, but these things come out and you don't realize it's just part of our society, part of the financial system. It's all built in there. Yeah. And we need to challenge that. Absolutely. Absolutely. And once you start, so what are people's priorities? What are you finding? Like people, child-free people, do they have sort of priorities for their retirement planning? Well, they're not retiring. Right, right. So they're just going to keep on different. going. Yeah. So what we're doing instead is investing in them. So great example. So you, you're doing the business you want to do because you enjoy it. Is that fair? Yes. yes. It's not because it makes the best financial sense. I mean, it might make good financial sense, but it, but you enjoy it. Hopefully it will soon. <laughs> well, no, I mean, this is the, the argument. I get people, you know, I want to open a cupcake shop. Well, that's yeah. not a great business, but let's do it. <laughs> or they're taking sabbaticals or or we have an approach we call the gardener and the rose where a couple, where one person's providing support and the other one's growing. Very common with child-free folks where we can shift, you know, because I think part of the challenge is, and let, let's, we'll test you again. There's a point we call the child-free midlife crisis. And we'll see if you ever hit this one. It's when you hit your personal and professional and financial goals, and then you're like, now what? Have you been there yet? Well, I, I just keep changing my goals. I just keep making them different and like, you know, turning everything on its head. So I maybe I had that for a few minutes. I think I every time I achieve a specific goal, I have that few minutes where I'm like, oh, I'm really bored. Now what? And then I just go blow it all up again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because what would happen in the normal, we call it the standard life script. You know, you, you get married, you have kids, all that. You know, it's the American dream, two and a half kids and the white picket fence in the house and all that. Is <laughs> that once you hit your goals, you shift them to your kids. You know, so uh -huh. now the kids have to achieve, you know, goal. Child-free folks hit it and then they're like, well, now what I'm going to do? What's my encore career? What's my second act? What's my, you know... You know, I, I always joke, I ask my clients, what do you want to be when you grow up? And it has nothing to do with age. You know, I got people in their 80s, I'm still asking that question. Yeah. And it's hard because there's no script. Right. There's no answer. Absolutely. It's so true. And then, so are we, do we need like money if we could just have some kind of a, a recurring income stream? I mean, are we more likely to be able to survive. I mean, not on social security, obviously, but on a, you know, a, a much mo more modest um, savings. There's just like misconception that being child-free means you're rich. Like just money comes out of the sky and just like falls on you. And I have yet to have that money fall on me. Have you, I mean, I'm <laughs> not happening. No. <laughs> um, I think what I've found in my data is if you actually look at net worth, the census looked at it, single childless women do have the highest net worth but it's not by a statistically significant amount. It's like a couple of grand. Yeah. Right? So it really doesn't matter. What I found is because raising your net worth through the sky and passing it on is not the goal, we can settle in at a much lower net worth. And then I spend more time talking to my clients about spending money than saving money. Yeah. And that's, that's a weird thing. You know, that's when you're much more yeah. fun conversation. Oh, it is. <laughs> you know, I, I think, you know, here's a great example. So a lot of financial planners, the vast majority of the market charge on a 1% asset under management fee, right? Well, what that does is that means the financial planner always wants your net worth to go up because their salary does. It's a built in conflict of interest with child free folks. It's true. Now, I'm an advice only. I charge for my time. You know, I don't manage the assets. And what ends up happening is you realize you'll make different choices. I got people that, you know, like, Hey, you know, I, I just had a conversation with somebody. Their dream was they always wanted to move to another state and, you know, just live a different life. And I was like, let's go take a hundred grand and do it. And they're like, what? I'm like, you've got millions of dollars. You can take a hundred grand for a year and go, you know, experience what? Yeah. And it blew their brain because like, that's not what we're taught. You got to save that money. You got to, and I'm like, no, go enjoy it. Yeah. And what I, the way I say it is live a life of child free wealth means you have time, money, and freedom. doesn't mean you're rich. Right. In actuality, having time, money, and freedom could be too many choices for people. Because, like, it's that paradox of choice. Do you find that that the folks are sort of, you know, immobilized by so many choices? So I meet with my clients on a monthly basis, and um, usually, kind of first half dozen meetings, we just get all their finances set in a good place. 
And then I'll do, do their numbers and I'm like, okay, every day you work from now on is going to your state, which you don't care about. And they'll be like, okay, then what do I do? I'm like, well, what do you want to do? And this is when their brain explodes. It's like, I don't know. I've been yeah. going up the career ladder. I've been doing that. Like, we're really talking about, you know, self-actualization, the higher, you know, yeah. higher stuff and going, what do you want your life to look like? And they go, nobody's ever asked me that question. I'm like, cool. Because here's the thing. Really what most of us do is an 18-year-old version of us picks which school we go to, which picks a career we go to. So we're stuck in a decision, the 18-year-old of us, which was all dumb of us. I mean, like the 18-year-old version of all of us was dumb. I don't care how smart you were. It's still dumb. Yeah. And we're living that life based on the decisions they made. And saying, hey, you know, I know you went to school for all that. Throw that away. Let's go do what you enjoy. Yeah. That's hard. Yeah. Yeah, I can see that for sure. People are going, what the heck are you talking about? I because also uh, so much of our identity, right, is tied up in that career that we are so good at, even though we might not 100% love it. Absolutely. We we recently did an episode. It's one of our uh, most popular, Money Guilt. And it's this discussion about, is it okay for you to have money and enjoy it while others are struggling? And it's a hard question. Right now in the U.S., there's a lot of people struggling. I'm not, you know, judging that at all. We all have to acknowledge our privilege and where we're at. I think then you go, okay, well, because they're struggling, I should struggle. No. You can't get sick enough to help a sick person get well. Yeah. (laughs) So you can pick a different life. And they go, well, but is that fair? I'm like, I don't care if it's fair. It's your (laughs) money. You know, you get a vote of what to do with it. They don't. So, but some of those people who are struggling, and I know I'm just being devil's advocate here because I 100% agree with you. but if some of those people who are struggling are your own family members, it's can be, it can feel bad. You can feel guilty. You can feel like, Oh, I can do more. I should do more. You know, they've got this problem or that problem, but. Yeah. I, I have quite a few clients who, you know, whether it's family or parents or whoever, you know, they got somebody they need to support. And my personal take on it, and I'm my own bias. So just go with it. I don't like giving money to family members because there's a lot of time the habits just don't match it. You know, it just, I don't give money to my family. members. I will pay for their medical bills. I'll pay for their, their groceries. I'll pay for other things. But what I've actually started doing with a lot of my clients is having them pay for help for them. So for example, elderly mom, you pay for an aging care manager who can go fight for her and, you know, make sure she's got insurance. Yeah. Or you got a family member that's struggling financially, you pay for a financial coach to help them through it. Or they're struggling with legal, you pay for their lawyer. Like you pay for people to teach them. Yeah. Now, if, they, if they're not interested in that, well, then my guilt's gone. Right. Like, yeah, exactly. You're absolutely right. Because, you know, they got themselves into a situation that your money is just going to make worse, <laughs> probably. <laughs> well, but, but I think what happens, people talk about money guilt. My way of handling it, it's not right. It's just the way is we kind of go, all right, give away half and, and enjoy half. You know, if you're going to spend $100,000 on travel, spend $100,000 on giving. Now, by the way, the giving will tend to, to people enjoy that more than the, than the travel even. But it's really a way to get that balance back if it really bothers you. Yeah. For other people, I'm like, it's your money. Like, seriously, do what yeah. you want with it. I yeah. don't care. You want to go buy Ferraris? Go buy Ferraris. I don't yeah. care. Yeah. You know, I, I have people like, they fall into what we call the blueberry problem. So here's the blueberry problem. People that have been great savers buy the buy the frozen blueberries because they're a dollar cheaper than the fresh blueberries. <laughs> and I'm like, just buy the damn blueberries. Seriously, you're fine. You're, you're laughing because you're buying the cheap blueberries, aren't you? <laughs> I never buy cheap blueberries. I never do. You've seen the people do this. I know. They've got I've millions seen of it. dollars and they're buying the cheap blueberries. I have to tell you a story. And I'm <laughs> my boyfriend's mom. We go to a restaurant and they she gets um what do you call it eggs benedict so it's two you know two sides of an english muffin two eggs and whatever so but she can't really eat the two eggs so she says to them well you know i only want one egg they're like okay and she's how much you know less is that and they're like a dollar she's like it's only a dollar like so so it's like 
oh, well, what should I do? Should I get the egg I don't want? Or, and then it's the same thing. It's like, you know, it's an extra dollar if you want fruit instead of, oh, never mind. I'll just have the home fries because I don't want to pay the extra dollar. I'm like, you have like a shit ton of money. Pay the extra dollar to get the fruit you want and forget the home fries. You know, it's so ridiculous if you don't like them. But yeah, and it's, it, it's, it's over tiny, tiny amounts of money. Right. And, and they're not enjoying their life. And, and I'm going, okay, then the money's going to your estate, which by the way, if you really screw up, the government takes 40% if you put too much to your estate. And you miss it. You know, I, I've used this blueberry example with quite a few clients and they kind of start laughing because I'm like, oh, you do that, huh? They're like, no, not the blueberry, but like the rotisserie chicken, the one I get is a dollar cheaper because it's, but I like the other one better. I'm like, uh, same thing. Or, or I somebody, oh, well, you know, I skipped the second margarita because I'm worried about, I'm like, you got $3 million. You can buy the second margarita. <laughs> you know, I'm not talking about YOLO, you know, let's put all our money, just spend it. And I'm just talking about how do you have a balance? Yeah. And what absolutely. happens is the way we do the dive with zero approach, or we call it wind down your wealth, is we figure out a plan for long-term care. So either insurance or money set aside, you put off social security to 70 and a little cash cushion. Now the cash cushion depends on my person, but you're not truly going to die with zero, but we put aside some money. Yeah. Then we set guardrails for the minimum amount to spend, not the maximum. And that like, people are like, what? I'm like, your investments return 300 grand this year. You need to spend that plus some for your net worth to go down. Right. And they're like, I can't do that. <laughs> well, then we're passing it on to another generation. Right? Or- if you, well, if they need help, you can send them my way. I'm so good at spending money. I like oh. I'm, I'm I I actually should get like some kind of an award <laughs> because I could go through that money in an afternoon. <laughs> well, I mean, so all right, the the fire community, the general financial independence community, they're very good at making pennies squeak. I mean, they can you know they're making their own soap to save money. Yeah, and I'm not judging. I'm just saying if that's what you enjoy. Cool. Yeah. And then they get to the fire and they're like, "What am I going to do in my retirement?" I'm like, "I don't." They're know. They're 27 years old. First. If you know, like, yeah, they're so young. Like, okay, now you're retired at 25. What the hell are you gonna do with the rest of your life? Well, what'll happen is if you built that habit of you've saved every penny, it is so hard to reprogram and say, okay, go enjoy your life. Yeah. So they get to retirement and they're like, now what? I'm like, well, you should have thought of what you were gonna retire to versus what yeah. you want to retire from. Exactly. Oh, that's such a beautiful way to say that. Absolutely true. Uh, you know, I, I think the hard part is we have so much emotion wrapped around money. I mean, 80% of your success with money is, is behavioral, at least. And all that baggage comes through and we need to change it. And for child-free folks, we need to throw away the entire life script we were taught. That's the hard part is like culture tells you this and, you know, your family tells you this and others, you know, for example, I, I, for child-free folks, buying a house is a choice, not a requirement. If you're going to move every three, four years, I got some nomadic people that like live in a different Airbnb every month. Yeah. Like buying a house makes no sense. Right. So renting actually allows you flexibility and people go, but I have to buy a house to make money. I'm like, no, you don't. There are other ways to do it. Well, not only that, people should stop thinking that their primary residence is an investment. It's not an investment, people. It's not an investment. If you're always going to have a house, so you're going to sell. It's like, that's like thinking of your car as an investment. If you're going to sell that car and get another car, you, you there's no, it's not an investment. It's just an expense, just rent. If, you, if you're if you just going to live in that house and then sell it and you and then buy another one, it's no kind of investment. Well, let me give you an example. So I had somebody in the mid thirties, couple, and they're going to buy a house. Okay. They said, well, we'd like to live in this state you know, when we retire. Okay. But we're going to move in three years for our job. I'm like, all right, what's your plan? Well, then we're going to rent out the house. I'm like, so you're going to be a remote landlord from 2000 miles away. By the way, that sucks. I mean, there's just, there's, there's no great way to do that. And then you think you're going to come back to this house in 30 years. After it's been rented for 30 years. I'm like, there is no chance of that. I mean, I can almost <laughs> bet zero chance you will come back to this house. There's very little in finance that I know for sure. The odds that you're going back to the same house 30 years from now is almost as close to zero as we get. Yeah. But that's what's in our head. You, you know, well, I pay it off and then I won't have a housing payment in, in retirement. Okay. Or I can make money in the market and afford to rent wherever I want. Right. <laughs> 
I, I just once you once you see all of these voices that are in our head telling us what to do, and you realize that's not the life I want to live. It's like, all right, what's next? Yeah, exactly. And you can rethink your whole. So, is, so you're as much of a like a a life coach as you are a financial planner, right? So we call it life and financial planning together. Yeah. Because the reality check is for child free folks in particular, life comes first. And if we don't figure that out right, we can actually solve the financial and miss the life. Yeah. And, and that's hard because people are like, well, but I need to retire. I'm like, well, no, you don't. That's a choice. I need to buy a house. No, you don't. I need to stay at this career. You know, like, no, you don't. You know, one of our other top podcasts is I'll make you quit your job. And I have a parent planner who works with me and she and she's the co-host of my podcast too. And she, she started tracking how many people I told them to quit their job. Because like, they'd be like, I'm miserable with my job. Okay. And I'm like, how much you make it? 150,000 a year. All right. So what you told me is for $150,000, you're willing to be miserable. And they're like, that's not what I said. I'm like- That's before taxes. <laughs> yeah, I was like, that's <laughs> literally what you said. Yeah. And people are like, but if I quit my job and I go you know, be a librarian, I had somebody- I'm going to make 40 grand a year. I go, are you going to be happier? Yeah. But my okay. retirement's going to get messed up. Well, retirement's not your goal. <laughs> like if you're being the librarian, you don't care about retirement. Right. That's your retirement plan is to do that. Something you love. Right. So, so if you want to call it life coaching, you want to call it, fine. I don't know. I kind of smush them all together. And because there's no real line, you know, a lot of people that, that are in financial planning, just do investment management. Investment management can be real simple. Yeah. All right. I mean, three fund portfolio, set it, forget it. Works perfectly fine. Yeah. Simple passive long-term investment. But what are you going to do with it? That's the question. And what I find is with my child-free folks, the first time we work through their goals, they'll say, okay, this is new, my new goal. Okay, cool. And then about six months later, they'll be like, yeah, that's not the one I wanted. I want something else. Because they've never thought about something else. Right. I'm like, okay, cool. Let's shift. You know, I've got people that have three, four different goals in a year. You know, they're going to, you know, they one day they're going to move to one country. Another day I moved to another state and another job. Like, all right, we got to make the financial plan fit it. Yeah. And that's hard. But it's so empowering. I mean, it's just, yeah, it's really, really powerful and fun. Once you get on board, right? Once you start thinking about it, you, you don't need to save all this money. You've already got plenty of money to not work at a job you hate. So stop and let's have some fun. Right. But you have to reprogram them. Yeah. It's like, well, then, then my retirement's going to be set back. Okay. Like, seriously, fine. That's okay. <laughs> exactly. And that's where people are like, no, everything says I need to. You know, and that's part of the problem. We call it mixing recipes. So you have people that are following 10 different people on the internet, good, bad, and ugly advice, and mixing recipes. Yeah. If you're going to follow the Dave Ramsey, I'm not saying you should or shouldn't. If you're going to follow Dave Ramsey, you cannot mix him with Grant Cardone. You know, one's no <laughs> debt, one's all debt. You just can't mix recipe. No. And for child-free folks, the answer is you need to find a recipe that matches you, not everybody else. And that's hard, especially when you're going against the grain. Yeah. That's so fun. I'm, I'm excited by this conversation because I did have like in the back of my mind, like, you know, here you are spending all your money to start all these businesses and expecting them to become a passive income stream. But at the end of the day, I don't actually need a gazillion dollars for retirement because I I'm not one by the time I'm ready to retire, it'll be time for me to go in some kind of a home anyway. And I and I think this, and I'm I'm gonna say this, and if you have children, I apologize, but I feel like that ages you. <laughs> like I feel like I'm gonna be always younger than someone my same age who has kids <laughs> because I didn't have all that body stress. <laughs> well, it's, my argument is it's not better or worse, it's just different. Right. I don't get a vote in their life, they don't get a vote in mine. You know, but You'd be amazed for, for those that are parents, you don't understand how often child-free folks get all these questions. We have a bingo card. We collect all the questions on, you know, well, who's <laughs> going to take care of when you're older and you know, how are you going to have a family? And you know, you'll never know what true love is. And like, you'll regret it. You'll regret it. I love that one. You'll regret it. I'd yeah. much rather regret not having kids than regret having kids. Right. Okay, much easier to undo than not having kids. <laughs> I mean, 
you are right. The actual data, by the way, does says, you know, having kids, having stress and blah, blah, blah. It, oh, it's kind of. But you, you're a great example. Say, okay, you run your business. If you run it for what you enjoy instead of what you want to make money, you run a completely different business. Yeah. You know, I serve child-free folks. I'm an advice-only planner. I could make a whole lot more money by just charging a percentage of my assets and just being a financial planner to some big firm. But then I wouldn't be serving the audience I want in the way I want in the mission-driven work. You know, I actually recently, I posted for a job opening at the company. And I said, in the, I said, send me a cover letter, which by the way, two thirds of people didn't put a cover letter. We'll, we'll ignore people don't know how to apply for a job anyway. But I said in the cover letter, explain why you want to serve child-free folks and what you want to learn in the position. It was a beautiful screening question. Yeah. Because I even said in the job description, I'm like, we don't pay the best, but we train the best. You know, we're going to get you in there. We're going to help you learn. We're... And it was amazing to see people that, hey, they truly want to give back. They want to do it for things. Money's not the priority. It's about the mission. Like, there's just something to that, yeah. that, you know, we can talk, we can start measuring lives touched instead of dollars made. Yeah. I mean, that's huge. That is huge. If it sounds like I'm, I'm recruiting people to child free costs, I'm not. I'm just saying we're, we got different ways <laughs> of doing it. It's okay if you want to have kids. We're not going to shun you, but. <laughs> you know, we, for those that don't know, August 1st is International Child Free Day. Is around, it? Uh, yep. So oh, celebration next years. year. All right. It was originally uh, international or national non-parents day. <laughs> and, you know, it's kind of like, you know, Mother's Day, Father's Day, whatever. And we did a uh, billboard in Times Square celebrating International Child Free Day. So we sponsored it and we had a whole bunch of people in there and like showing their lives. And I had to laugh, you know, people were pretty proud of who was on it and somebody put it on their Instagram and the, the haters come out because, you know, now you've mentioned the word child free, you know, and they said that they were talking about my company now. They're saying, well, you're part of a global psyop to depopulate the world. And I'm like, what the heck? Like, all I said was, hey, we have a day and, you know, we're celebrating. <laughs> <laughs> like, and, and I was like, all right, cool. That's where it is. You know how we describe that? Misery loves company. <laughs> <laughs> I joke, but I have so many people praying for my soul because I'm child free. You know, like I made the, I'm like, all right, cool. Pray for me. Good luck. <laughs> oh, my God. That's awesome. Jay, I love talking to you. I could talk to you all afternoon, um, but you probably don't. You probably have other stuff to do. So tell me one thing that you wish I would have asked you, one thing that we haven't touched on, something that you want to make sure everybody knows before we part ways today. Rather than a question, what's the biggest thing you've seen that's different because you're living a child-free life? Everything. My decision-making process, right? I can be if I want to do something, go somewhere, be something, change my job, move, do anything, I don't have to consult anybody. I just freaking pack my bag and go, right? I just sell my house, sell my business, start all over again, reinvent myself. And it's just completely liberating. Yeah. I think, you know, if you had asked me the question, you know, we, my wife and I, she, she's the rose right now. I'm the gardener. We're, you know, she's growing. I'm providing support is the way we look at it. And she got a job offer and 1200 miles away and we packed up the dog and the cat and drove by the way you got to see two two massives in the back of a prius that's a separate <laughs> and, you know, kind of a fun photo but that was it like it was not a big deal yeah you know and, and you know you could try things you're like did that work no nope. okay let me do something else you know like it's, yeah and, and i think that's the difference i think the hard part is you need to make sure your face is matching so yeah. for so my one set of advice for anyone listening is if you are child free if you are working with a financial plan, ask them how your financial plan is different. If they say it's not, you got to walk out. If they say, well, you'll change your mind, walk out. You know, if they say they don't know and they'll figure it out, I'm okay with that answer. But it's just that assumption that it's the same that is yeah. so dangerous. Yeah. And it's definitely not. It doesn't make any sense at all. Why do I want to have $5 million sitting in my stock portfolio for, you know, whoever is still around when I turn 105, you know? Now all of our nephews are going to be like, they just talked and now I'm not getting any money, but all right. <laughs> if I'm going to kill them off, I better do it soon because <laughs> they're spending my money every day that goes by. I'm getting less of an inheritance. <laughs> exactly. 
Awesome. Jay, thanks so much. How can people reach you? Because I know there are people out there that are just like banging their heads now going, oh my God, I didn't even think about how different my life should be and my financial plan should be because I don't have kids. Yeah, we're, we're kind of old school. Got the website still, childfreewealth.com. Um, Child Free Wealth on all the socials, except for Twitter, because he said childless folks should not have a vote, just in case you missed that one, because we don't have a stake in the future. So we've, uh, we don't, <laughs> we don't interact there. Sure, um, or sense. the Child Free Wealth podcast, they're where you buy. Cool. Excellent. Yes, definitely check out the podcast. It sounds like a lot, a lot of great information. Thank you, Jay, so much for being with us today. And thank you listeners for listening. I bet you know somebody who is child free and I bet that they would thank you immensely if you forward this episode to them. And we would thank you immensely too. So thanks for tuning in. Have a fantastic day. Be sure to look Jay up. Look up Jay. I guess that's, I don't want to split my infinitives.